Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Pi Crowdcast. We've got Aaron Hockley here with us today, and I'm excited to talk to him. Hope you get your questions in. I'm Rick Tarosi, co-founder and general manager of Pi, and I'll be your host for this session. So um, as I mentioned on Twitter, you might have seen Aaron has been with Pi since almost day one, kind of documenting with photography what's happened in the space, our demo days, um, you know, some editorial content of how the space works. So he's super familiar with Pi, but he even predates Pi with involvement in the open source community and startup community. And so, Aaron, it's a pleasure to have you here. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Hopefully yeah. I'm able to share something interesting with folks today. I'm sure you will be. Um, maybe give us a little context, like give us your background, um, what got you into phot photography, what you're doing now. Right. So, yeah. So my background is uh, in the tech world. Uh, I went to school, started out studying computer science, and then dropped out of college to take a job that, you know, seemed more interesting than going to college was. And you know, I don't know whether that was the right decision or the wrong decision, but it seems to have worked out okay. So my background was in tech and software development. And then at some point, um, I started taking pictures as a hobby in the, you know, probably right around the year 2000 or so. Um, and, you know, taking pictures of random different things. And um, in the early 2000s, um, started going to a lot of kind of the independent Portland tech events that were happening and things like that. And you know, I had a camera with me because I was a photographer and I started just taking some pictures for fun and transitioned that into doing photography uh, professionally part time. And that's, you know, how I started to take a lot of pictures of um, early, some of those early kind of indie Portland tech events from, you know, Ignite Portland, Bar Camp, mm -hmm. yep. Open Source Bridge, uh, and things like that. And then, uh, as you mentioned, uh, I've photographed Pi uh, almost from the beginning. I remember, uh, I remember photographing the uh, the big launch event for Pi, where you guys oh, blocked yeah. off blocked off a, a street over in the Pearl District, mm -hmm. and uh, Mayor Sam Adams was there with his giant scissors to cut the ribbon <laughs> to kick everything <laughs> off, and uh, that's kind of the beginning. And I've been photographing uh, Pi ever since. All the you know, this year's demo day, it was kind of a bummer to be, I screenshotted it from home, but yeah. it really wasn't. You, the st same. you still photograph demo day one way right. or the other. It really wasn't quite the same, but uh, <laughs> um, yeah. And along the way I've photographed um, a lot of the Pi startups and a lot of the other uh, tech mm -hmm. companies in Portland. Um, you know, so a lot of my business has been um, photography for small businesses and startups. Um, and then the other big chunk of my business that has completely evaporated in the last uh, six weeks or so is I did a lot mm -hmm. of event photography for yeah. special events other than weddings. So conferences, trade shows, company meetings, all of that. And that uh, yep. that's not really a thing in right now. So, <laughs> Right. Are you, are you seeing that ripple throughout the industry? Are you seeing particular segments affected? Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting. There is almost no professional photography of any sort that's really happening right mm -hmm. now due to the nature of the restrictions we're under. Um, you know, there's, there's you know, no in-person weddings that are really happening if you're smart. Um, there's no in-person yeah. events of any sort that are happening. Um, you know, you, uh, you might be able to get away with somehow doing some outdoor portraiture if you're able to keep some distance, but... Uh, you know, studio portraiture or, you know, business work or commercial work or things like that is pretty much all shut down as, you know, not just here in the Northwest, but nationwide at this point, pretty much every non-essential business and, you know, worker is being told to stay home and stay separated. And, um, you know, so photographers are definitely feeling the pinch of all this. Yeah. Um, you know, most of us who do photography are freelancers. And so, um, you know, like any freelance business, you know, you're, you're on your own to keep that, uh, that incoming stream of clients running and yep. that incoming stream has kind of vaporized right now. And so that's, that's a struggle that, uh, you know, all of us photographers are going through much like everybody else right now. Um, you know, the couple of photography trade associations are trying to do what they can to help us get connected with the right resources. Um, mm -hmm. you know, but, um, you know, as we've all seen the the resources coming from the federal and state governments, there have been some you know some hiccups with that, and things haven't yeah. all 
haven't quite played out as advertised initially, but uh, <laughs> shocking, <laughs> right? Shocking, big, yeah. Big surprise, yeah. But uh, you know, it's interesting. I mean, it's you know, I, I wish I could say I have a bunch of great rosy optimism that things are all going to be fine here in a couple yeah. months. But the reality is, um, you know, if we end up under, you know, a lockdown of some sort, you know, even a, a smaller lockdown or a restricted lockdown for a period of time, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's probably a lot of photographers that aren't going to weather that. There's probably a lot of people that are going to have to pivot. I mean, if we can't have, if we can't have big events for a long time, how are marriages going to look? What is a wedding going to look like? Right. What's right. a wedding photographer going to do? So, yeah. Are there, <laughs> yeah, on that happy note, uh, right. I was, I was really curious and I don't know if you monitor this much, but I would assume you'd hear, hear about this from your, through your professional associations. So like, I was curious if like product photography was able mm -hmm. to kind of weather this, like, are they doing okay? But, that would be a thing that could still be happening, right? I mean, okay. I know um, I have a colleague here in the Portland area who does a lot of jewelry photography. And so, mm -hmm. you know, his end of, his end of, <laughs> uh, don't mind the, the dogs in the background. They're very excited because, you know, probably a neighbor walked by or something. Right. Um, excited to be on Crowdcast. That's, right. that's all it is. You know, hey, we're all <laughs> stuck at home. <laughs> um Anyway, where is it going? Oh, product photography. And so like his MO is very often that a client will, um, you know, bring a product over and drop it off mm -hmm. at his, you know, his home studio and then he'll have it for a few days or a week or whatever to photograph it and all that. And so for something yep. like that, um, you know, that person would be able to adapt. I mean, you know, they can, you know, drop it off on the front porch and he can bring it in and do his photography work and things like that. I think it's probably the, you know, events, you know, any sort of person to person photography, yep. um, you know, and really when you look at um, the photo industry overall, and especially, you know, kind of the retail photo industry, that's pretty much all of it, whether it's senior portraits, whether it's maternity pictures, whether it's weddings, um, you know, that's all, that's all on pause right now. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thanks for that context. <laughs> I think, I mean, that that helps to know that I think many of us get kind of stuck in our own silo of what's going on and don't really recognize how widespread this impact is. So mm -hmm. it's it's good to have that understanding of what, what your industry is going through as yeah. well. Yeah, I mean, and I think there's a lot of, you know, I think freelancers often get overlooked when we talk about, you know, the job market and economic mm -hmm. impacts and things like that. And, yep. um, you know, there's some aspects of the freelance industry that are still able to continue relatively undisturbed, right? I mean, if you're a logo designer, for example, right. you know, right. not too hard to, you know, I mean, maybe you would have had in-person meetings before, but not too hard to switch those to a virtual thing. I mean, I do some some consulting and work uh, helping other photographers out with kind of the tech aspects of their business. I had a call this morning with a photographer to talk him through setting up a new website and some um, things like that. And so, yep. you know, was able to continue doing that without a problem. But, um, you know, if, you know, for the aspects of it that do need to be face to face, um, folks are kind of, uh, kind of screwed right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, one of the things you've already kind of touched on it and, oh, just in case folks don't know where ask a question is, it's right down there at the, at the very bottom of the screen. So that's where you can go to find the questions, upvote questions, ask your own. Um, one of the things I've always really appreciated about you, Aaron, is you have a very, um, kind way of instructing people about how to do things. You're clearly skilled, you clearly work at a high level, but you're able to kind of make that accessible to other people, which is why I really wanted to have you on here because I mm -hmm. think a lot of folks are struggling with this, how, how do they behave now? They've either been forced into being more active on social, which might not be something that's comfortable for them, but they want to do something either personally mm -hmm. or for their business, or they're forced to being, you know, doing somewhat professional level work because they have an e-commerce site they need to stand up or they need right. new photography for a website or something along those lines. So maybe just give us some like 
quick 101 kind of tips for things to be thinking about um, and things that you recommend people consider before they start approaching their own photography? Right. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of places that have gotten uh, put into that boat. I mean, I think it's been interesting interesting to see the number of, uh, you know, e-commerce stores that have sprung up overnight. I would, mm -hmm. I would love to have some statistics from, you know, a Shopify or a Squarespace or those kind of platforms that people are using to put those together. I mean, I even know... Um, as you know, I'm kind of a, a beer nerd. And so yeah. as, as all the breweries locally, um, you know, maybe never had any sort of online sales before, they're all now adapting to very quickly figure out how can we sell beer online that people can come pick up at our breweries. Um, right. It's been interesting to see all those stores pop up and yeah, they want photos of their cans or photos of their, their tap handles or whatever it is that they're using. Um, and so um, I think um, the good news is that easily accessible photography hardware that's, you know, good enough for, you know, most uses is, is, mm -hmm. is out there now, right? I mean, if you're asking this question in 1997, the question, you know, the answer would be very different. But um, honestly, if you're looking to kind of do some quick and dirty stuff for social media mm -hmm. or for, you know, for a, in these times e-commerce store in a pinch, the reality is, um, you know, I'm going to be honest, like, you know, the camera on your iPhone is pretty darn good. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, and there's some things that you can do, um, to think about as you start to take those pictures that, you know, are going to really help you out. Right. So one of the things to always consider is, um, you know, is light, <laughs> you know, that's what photography is all about. And, mm -hmm. You know, the main thing I think where people um, get into trouble with light is they think more light is better light. And it's funny, as we're having this conversation, mm -hmm. the sun just poked yeah. out and I saw, I saw that. that. <laughs> I just got a hot spot show up on the side of my face because there's a window off to my um, But um, they think that more light is better light or that bright light is better light. And the reality is, um, you know, you want a soft, consistent light, right? A photographer loves to do outdoor pictures on a cloudy day. Mm. I'd rather have that than I would a, a bright blue, you know, clear sky with some harsh sun. And so as you look at making a picture of, you know, a product or something like that to, um, to put onto your social media or onto your store, you know, consider that, consider that, um, you know, you probably don't want a spotlight on the product. You probably want, a, you know, kind of a broad diffused light, right? So, mm. I mean, even if you're using something like, um, you know, maybe you've got like a shop light or something that you're using, or maybe you've got a table lamp, or maybe you've got, you know, uh, you know, some other, you know, a light in your office or something that you're using. Mm. Um, if you can find a way to kind of diffuse and flatten that light, whether that's to, you know, hang a, you know, white sheet in front of it, whether that's to, um, you know, use something to kind of broaden that light out and to flatten and soften it. Mm. Um, that's going to result in, you know, a more flattering picture. Um, especially if you're talking about kind of where you've been, you know, put in a position of needing to take pictures of a product to put it online. Mm -hmm. Um, that's going to let you, um, you know, that's going to let you have a, uh, you know, a better thing. The other thing to consider with any sort of these pictures is figure out what's going to be in the background. <laughs> a yeah. lot of times people don't always think about that. And so they'll just set something on the, you know, set something on the desk or on the table mm. or, you know, on an end table and they'll start taking a picture of it. And what they won't realize is that, oh, there's in the background, you know, there's a bookcase that has a really bright orange book spine that's going to jump out once you finish that picture or things like yep. that. Yep. Um, you know, so again, just consider what's going to be in the background um, because if you're just starting out doing this is not the time to start figuring out, you know, how can I do a background replacement in Photoshop? Um, right. That's going to be a, right. a frustrating venture to deal with. Um, let's see. You know, one of the other things I would say is um, especially like if you're talking about a smartphone camera, if you're talking about e even a DSLR, mm -hmm. um, cameras now have gotten pretty good at taking pictures when there's not a lot of ambient light. And so I would resist the urge to use the flash if possible. <laughs> um, you know, you might think you want to use the flash to put more light onto that, onto that subject, whatever it may be, but turning off the flash is going to probably simplify your lighting scenario because when you turn that flash on, 
excuse me, and that flash is coming, you know, you know, the back of my iPhone, you can see the flash is right next to the camera lenses. Right. Um, you know, that flash is going to create a bunch of reflective highlights um, that aren't going to be real flattering for whatever that subject is. Um, you know, whether it's a product that you're trying to sell or whether it's, you know, one of your coworkers that's, you know, modeling the new trucker cap you're trying to sell in your store right. or something like that. So, right. um, you know, turn off the flash, look for kind of a broad light, look for soft light, pay attention to the background. Um, you know, I think those are probably some, some quick tips, I would say. Okay. Well, while we're on the topic of smartphones, there's a there's a question about how can I take amazing pics with my smartphone? But maybe you can also dive into, are there certain settings or features on a typical smartphone that people don't even consider when they're trying to take photos? Right. Um, a, c a couple things, you know. So one of the things to consider is um, when you go into... You know, when you can go into your camera or your smartphone, um, if you have the option of choosing multiple lenses, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, feel free to do that. Um, if you, uh, in general, the, um, you know, you probably want to try and fill the frame, especially for the type of photography that we're talking yep. about here. If you're being put in the position of needing to put together an e-commerce store or put some stuff, content together for social media. Um you know, if uh, one thing to consider is stabilization of the camera, you know, so you mm -hmm. get shaky hands or if you're in a really low light situation where the camera on the phone is going to try and do a longer exposure to let more light in, um, any sort of shake on the phone or your camera is get, possibly going to result in a blurry picture. So um, while you might not have a tripod and a tripod mm -hmm. mount for your phone, um, that's probably not going to fall in the category of essential things that Amazon's going to ship right out to you overnight at this point. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, consider what you might be able to stabilize it on, right? So even if you are able to, you know, if you're going to take a picture of something on a table, if you can brace, you know, both of your arms on the table so that you're kind of creating your own tripod that's going to be a little more stable mm -hmm. than just you holding it out there with one hand, um, you know, if you've got something like that, um, the other thing to consider is, um, you know, take a look at the camera settings on your phone, right? So with, mm -hmm. um, you know, with an iPhone, and I imagine modern Android phones are the same way, right? You know, when you put the, the camera up, it's going to pick out what it thinks is the subject and what it should focus on, things like that. But you can tap on that screen to tell it what is the main subject and use this part of the image mm -hmm. to set the exposure. Um, once you've done that, you can then, you know, at least on the, uh, you know, the iPhone, you can slide your finger to to lock that exposure and let you still move it around and get a consistent mm -hmm. exposure there um the other thing is um there are uh, you know one of the things to consider I, I already mentioned you know don't use the flash if you don't have to yep. um you know and then if you um you know the other thing is film is cheap, right? right. <laughs> film is free yeah. at this point. And so <laughs> don't feel bad about the fact that you might end up taking several different shots and end up throwing seven of them away because that eighth mm -hmm. shot is the one that um, that got you what you want. And I would say, look at it and experiment, right? I mean, if you take some pictures and you find that, oh, I've got a weird light coming in from the left side of my picture, figure out where mm -hmm. that light is coming from. Um, you know, do you need to go turn off the light on the other side of your room because it's causing a weird cast in your picture or something like that? Yep. Um, you know, the good news, like I said, is that, you know, like with a modern iPhone or with a modern, you know, Android camera, the software does a lot of work for you. <laughs> yep. um, you know, and even if you were to compare, you know, I know, I was talking, we were talking earlier about Apple just released a new iPhone SE today. And, yep. you know, I mean, if you were to talk about like the last phone that was in that generation of iPhone and that smaller form factor that I think it was the iPhone 8, um, yeah. you know, that's about four generations of iPhone OS old when that was released. Mm -hmm. And uh, every time that software gets updated, there's a lot more that's going on behind the scenes with, with artificial intelligence, with computational photography, that's doing a lot of that work for you. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, in some ways you're going to benefit just by having a, you know, a modern smartphone 
um, you know, because there's a lot of stuff that's going to happen for you automatically. Yep. Um, so without sounding too much like Seinfeld, what is the deal with HDR? What like I'm, I, I always feel obligated to like turn it on, but I don't ever see it really improving the quality of my photos. I mean, granted, the photographer is to blame, but still, I'm curious <laughs> about that setting. What is the deal with HDR? And it's kind of interesting. HDR has gone through an evolution. HDR, when it first came onto the scene, I don't know, probably close to 10 years ago now, um, HDR was known as the way that you got those kind of wild and crazy out of this world effects, right? Mm. You could take a picture and you would end up with, you know, crazy, bright, vivid highlights that weren't blown out. And you saw all the detail in the shadows that wasn't blocked up into black. Mm -hmm. um, and you often created these images that were almost kind of surreal because they had more dynamic range to them than maybe even your eye was able to see. Yep. Um, and initially it's like, oh, these are awesome. And then at some point you had a whole genre of photography that was like, oh, that's a crazy overprocessed HDR photo. And there was uh -huh. kind of this swing and pushback. And yep. what we're at now, if we talk about, you know, HDR in 2020 is your phone your um your camera is going to be doing hdr even if you don't think that it is by default okay. so um you know, i'm double I, hdring it by pressing right, the hdr button right. and so like yeah. you know the last couple of generations of the iphone for example they have something called smart smart hdr and it's turned on mm -hmm. by default okay. and really what it is is it's less about creating these you know surreal weird images anymore um, and it's more about the camera using multiple exposures to get you a picture that better represents what your eye is going to see um, you know one of the things that i started working on um, is that i've been writing a book all about artificial intelligence and photography and there's a big chunk there where i'm talking about how so much of what happens now when you tap that shutter button on your iphone or on your android device um, you know, very rarely is it capturing just one frame and that's your picture. Very mm. often what's happening is it's capturing, um, you know, a series of, you know, of images. Um, and in some cases it even starts capturing those before you tap that shutter button so that when you tap that shutter button, it has some mm. of those images ready to go. And so essentially your camera might create one resulting picture, but it's done that by doing an HDR behind the scenes. Mm. And, um, you know, if we talk about something like uh, the night mode on the iPhone, or I think Andrew mm -hmm. calls it night sight, that's exactly what it's doing is that it's capturing a series of images with different exposure levels, some to bring in more light, some to bring in more detail in the subject, and then it blends those all together to create a resulting image. And so you're going to end up using HDR whether you want to or not. Hmm. Um, okay. And you don't really need to even think about it anymore. I mean, you can still take that and you can put it into a, an editing program and add you know, you know, bring out additional detail in those shadows or try and, you know, capture more in the highlights or things like that. But, um, you know, you don't actually have to think about it as much anymore unless you really are going for those, uh, those artistic effects. And that's a great segue into another thing I was curious about with that much technology happening within the handset and with artificial intelligence and all that kind of thing. Are you seeing uh, a change in your workflow for post-production? Like, are you spending as much time as you used to editing photos or are they genuinely better when you get them? I'm spending less time editing photos. I think there's probably two aspects to that. One of it is I think I'm getting better at capturing the photos. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the longer that I do it, um, you know, but the other aspect is that the software is getting better and not just, you know, not just the software in post-processing, but the software in the camera, whether that's in my iPhone or whether that's in a DSLR or a mirrorless body, yep. um, because that software is getting better, you're getting better results straight out of the, out of the camera. Mm -hmm. Um, but when you do bring it into, um, you know, software to edit it, whether that's, you know, Apple Photos or Adobe Lightroom or Photoshop or, um, you know, another product, um, you know, that software is getting a lot smarter as well, right? You know, yep. it used to be, if we go back 10 years, if you brought something into editing software and you went and you clicked the, you know, auto 
button, right? You know, the, mm -hmm. the automatic button, make it better picture. Yeah, right. usually get some pretty bad results very often. Very rarely would you hit the auto button and it turned out to be a great image. Um, but because of all the different advancements being made in imaging technology, at this point, um, you know, that auto button at very often um, does some good things. It can figure out, oh, I need to enhance this part of the image or not enhance that part of the image. You know, and that's where some mm -hmm. of that AI comes into play as well, right? If, if you've got a portrait of someone, the software is going to be smart enough to know that, oh, yeah, maybe I need to sharpen the details in the eyes, but I don't want to necessarily sharpen every wrinkle that the person has on their face as well. And that's because the software right. can figure that out. It knows what a face is. So, um, you know, the good news is that the, the editing software has gotten a lot better along with the cameras as well. Okay, um, which leads into this next question. Uh, any tools to touch up pictures without breaking my budget? So do you have recommendations for software suites or editing suites that are affordable for folks at this point in time? Right, yeah. Um, so I'll give you kind of a couple different options. Um, you know, so if you want to go for the big boy tools, the ones that everybody, you know, the professionals use and um, and all that. The good news, uh, say what you want about software subscriptions and software subscription mm -hmm. pricing. Um, but the good news is that it's no longer a $600 investment to get into Adobe Photoshop. Um, mm -hmm. Adobe was one of the first major software manufacturers to move to a subscription model for its flagship products. You can get for $9 and 99 cents a month, Adobe calls it their photographer plan. Um, mm -hmm. And that gets you subscription access to use Photoshop, uh, Lightroom, and a few other kind of supporting smaller tools. Um, so if you really want to get into it seriously and you're willing to spend $10 a month, that's an option to do that. And when you're talking about having access to Photoshop and Lightroom, you really have the ability to do, you know, anything. I mean, Photoshop is a beast. Um, mm -hmm. There's very few people that use, you know, probably even half of its features to their capabilities. Um, if you're looking for something that's maybe a little more approachable, uh, doesn't have quite as steep of a learning curve and that you might um, already have, um, you know, if you're on, um, if you're on the Apple platform, um, Apple Photos has gotten pretty good. Um, mm -hmm. And it's a great way to kind of manage your images because whether you're using your Mac, or your iPhone, iPad, any, any of those Apple devices, everything can sync across with iCloud. Um, but there's also some great software um, that's available um, for photo editing and photo management, um, kind of from some third-party and independent companies that have really come onto the scene in the last few years. Mm -hmm. um, if you're on the Apple platform, take a look at uh, Pixelmator. And okay. Pixelmator, Pixelmator Photo or Pixelmator Pro, I'm trying to remember. I think Pixelmator Pro is the Mac version. Um, it is about, I want to say it's about $40, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a one-time purchase. That's not a subscription. And it does a lot of really great photo editing things. Um, another one you might want to look at is uh, Luminar from Skylum Software. That's available for both mm -hmm. Mac and Windows. Um, and it's in the, I want to say it's in the $80 range, $90 range. Um, and again, these are applications that can help you do, you know, some kind of just basic generic enhancements. Um, but they're also now bringing in, you know, more of the kind of the machine learning and AI things as far as, you know, enhancing portraits, um, you know, providing more, you know, interesting looks to your, your landscape images, things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, and then if you're, uh, the other thing is there's some really great photo tools, um, you know, on, on your phone, in your pocket anymore. Um, it's kind of a, a dated tool at this point. It hasn't had a lot of great updates lately, but Snapseed, um, mm. which, uh, originally was from a different company and then got acquired, I believe it originally got acquired by Nick and then Nick got acquired by Google. Google's the current owner of it. Um, I still use Snapseed to edit a lot of my images on my, on my <laughs> mobile device. Yep. Um, there's a version of Pixelmator for the iPhone as well. Um, you know, a lot of people like using uh, Visco, V-S-C-O, mm -hmm. for editing their images. Uh, unfortunately, saw it today on Twitter. Apparently, Visco yeah. laid off a whole bunch of people. Um, yeah. So that's kind of a bummer. But... Um, 
Visco is another great tool um, that's out there that you can use to to work with things. And the main thing, the only way you're going to get good at photo editing is to do a whole bunch of it. Okay. Um, try some effects, try some edits, see what you like, see what doesn't work, um, and then um, you know, and then kind of go from there. Adjust, right? I mean. Mm-hmm as I look at my images and how I've made them better over the years. And, you know, as I look at, you know, when I enter, when I enter formal photographic competition and I do, you know, when I have good results from that, I look at that and I realize that's because I've had lots and lots of bad results in the past. (laughs) (laughs) I've taken that feedback and, and spun that back in. So play around with the photo editing and be like, Hey, what happens if I, Oh, well, if I, if I increase the sharpness too far, here's how that ruins the image. Or if I take the saturation, oh, well, if I do this much, it does good things. Or if I do that much, it does bad things and to play yep. around with it. Yep. Cool. Thank you. Um, and I wanted to say hi to uh, Reverend Nat, who is in the comments. Thank you <laughs> to our unofficial sponsor of the Pi Crowdcast. It's always good <laughs> to see him. Uh, so with all that, thank you for that commercial break. Um, right. for, for all that power that even a common user has in their hands these days, I think there's there's now a darker side to your industry where people might not be as willing to hire a photographer. So I think this question really gets at that, which is how do you communicate the value of a professional shoot to folks who have a habit of just framing their request as just a quick shoot, it won't take that long, or I could probably do this on my own if I wanted to. How do you how do you kind of combat that that line of reasoning mm-hmm. with folks? So the good news is that photographers have been dealing with this for about 15 years at this point, (laughs) because, um, you know, when you look at the photo industry, there, there's two big, huge changes that happened. Um, you know, one, the internet showed up and made it very easy to, uh, distribute, um, you know, images instead of sending prints everywhere. Well, now we can just send a digital file. Um, you know, digital files don't look nearly as good hanging on your wall, but it's a quick way (laughs) to send a snapshot, right? It'll replace sending that four by five or four by six through the mail. The Mm -hmm. other big change that photographers have been dealing with is, uh, really good cameras got really affordable and accessible. Um, you know, if you go back to say, I mean, I got married in the year 2000 and that was very early in the digital age. And the reality was if you wanted to produce really good images there i mean in my photographer shot on film still at that point you know you needed ten thousand plus dollars of camera gear to really be able to make good photos um now the reality is that you know the smartphone i carry with me every day you know or even if i go down to you know costco i can buy a three four hundred dollar dslr camera kit that is going to have a body and a lens or two with it that are going to take fantastic images mm-hmm. um and so you know, it forced photographers to figure out how to differentiate themselves in ways other than i have an, a camera and i can make prints yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. and so the good news is uh, we've been uh, we've been making that uh, that argument for a while. Um, the bad news is that this is probably going to accelerate the people thinking they can do it on their own. And the reality is yeah. you can do more on your own than you used to be able to do. And so I'm not going to mm-hmm. try and say that you always need to hire a pro photographer for everything. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think what you're going to get out of a professional in a photographer is that you're going to get consistency. You're going to get someone who has probably done something very similar uh, generally a lot of times in a row <laughs> or not in mm-hmm. a row, but in the past, yep. um, you know, and so like when you hire me to photograph an event, you know, and I look at it when I talk about doing event photography for someone and I'm talking to a potential client, my competition as an event photographer isn't necessarily um, some of the other really good event photographers in town. My competition is Hmm. that corporate event and them choosing to hire me versus, you know, Steve in human resources who likes to take pictures of waterfalls on the weekend. Right. Um, Because, you know, Steve's got a camera and Steve's a hobbyist and he goes up to Multnomah Falls and makes some, you know, some nice pictures of, of the waterfall. Well, the reality is making pictures of the waterfall is a little different than 
you know, photographing like the conference I photographed last month, right before everything locked down, um, you know, where I was in the dimly lit uh, event area in the basement of the Hilton in downtown Portland. And I'm photographing, um, you know, an award ceremony on stage and I'm photographing it in bad lighting conditions or, um, you know, they're kicking off their luncheon by having a dance troupe from one of the local high schools perform. Mm -hmm. And so I have the combination of low light and fast moving action. <laughs> and, um, you know, how do you capture that to make that look interesting and good? Right. And so, um, you know, like when you hire me to photograph an event, you're not just hiring me because I'm going to show up with a decent camera and with, you know, mm -hmm. a backup camera in case something goes wrong and all that type of stuff. You know, you're also hiring the fact that I photographed events for 10 plus years at this point. Mm -hmm. And so I'm bringing all of that experience around where do I need to be at the right time? Um, you know, what are the gotchas that bit me in the past that I'm not going to let bite me again? Yep. Um, you know, and, you know, knowing what questions, you know, when you hire a professional, um, you know, a lot of times what you're hiring with that professional and you may not realize it at the time, but they're probably going to be asking you some questions even before you start the shooting yep. that are really going to lead to success. You know, they're going to be asking you questions in advance about what are, where are you going or what are you looking to get out of this? Right. Yep. So, yep. you know, I do business headshots fairly frequently for small businesses. And a lot of times, you know, when somebody calls me up and says, yeah, I need a new headshot. It's like, okay, well, what are you, you know, what are you going for right here? We, do we just need one shot or do we need multiple? Mm -hmm. Are you trying to match the look of other images? Because very often a business might have, you know, a page on their website or pages on their website where they want to have a consistent look. Um, you know, and that's the kind of thing where if you get a skilled professional and you've got an example of an existing image, you be like, hey, I want to make another portrait that looks like this one. And right. Pro is going to be able to look at that and understand the lighting in that image and figure out how the posing and the lighting and all that work together so that I can make an image that, that looks similar. I had one of those gigs just a couple months ago where a distributed company, um, you know, again, was looking to get consistent images on their website. And mm. they had people in Boise and they had people in Spokane. Um, you know, and they have one person who was in Vancouver, Washington, and they wanted an image of him that looked just like the images of everyone else. Oh, and so, yeah. um, you know, the photographer who photographed their Spokane person actually referred them to me. And uh, I was able to go out and went to this person's house and made an image at their house mm -hmm. that ended up looking consistent with all the rest of the images. And so um, that's a lot of kind of that, that professional experience that you're hiring when you hire a professional photographer. Um, you know, and the thing is with, you know, with the just a quick shoot that won't take long, um, yeah. you know, a lot of it is, um, you know, everything that goes into that because sometimes the shot won't take long. Right. I mean, so when I did that shot for the, um, that one I was just describing that where I needed to be consistent with Boise and Spokane, yep. I was only at that guy's house for about 30 minutes. And, you know, right. the first 10 minutes of that was setting up what I needed to set up. The last, you know, five to 10 minutes was breaking down things afterwards. And we only shot for maybe 15 minutes, um, you know, but you weren't hiring me for 15 minutes of labor for shooting. Really, what you were hiring me for was all of the knowledge to be able to do it in that 15 minutes. Um, right. You know, yep. he's, he's a patent attorney. I don't know what his time is worth. Mm -hmm. But I suspect that it's a much better use of his time to be able for me to be able to be in and out of there in, you know, half an hour um, than to have him, you know, drive to a studio or to have me go out there and take two hours to do that. And so yeah. um, a lot of that thing, you know, photographers who, who sell their services on an hourly rate really are kind of undervaluing all of what they bring to, um, you know, bring to that experience. Yep. That makes a lot of sense. Um so Steve's going to be spending a lot of his isolation down. Hobbyist Steve is going to be spending a lot of his isolation downtime touching up his waterfall photos. Right. Where where do people post photos these days? I mean, Instagram's the obvious one, but like back in the day, it used to be Flickr or it was like Smug Mug, and now Smug Mug owns Flickr or whatever. Like, right. like if you want your photos to be seen online where do you where do you frequent so yeah oh, the good old days when everybody used Flickr. um so <laughs> Flickr is still around 
but it definitely doesn't have the uh, the momentum that it once had, right? I mean, if you go back to the early two thousands, you know, we had, you know, any any of the the tech events we posted, you know, or our what and our waterfall photos and our, mm -hmm. our kid photos and all that, they all ended up on Flickr. Flickr is still a great place if you want to get your out your images out there to the point where they might just get get discovered by the general internet. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and Flickr's pretty, um, you know, I would recommend if you're into photography, a Flickr Pro account, which I think is about $60 a year, um, you know, is, is certainly worth it. It gets you an ad free experience, not just yeah. for you, but also for anybody who are viewing your images. Um, and how weird is it in 2020 to be talking about posting things online in an ad free experience? Um, right. Right. You know, <laughs> wacky it turns out there's this concept where you build a service and people pay you money for it instead of saying value. advertising yeah. right mm -hmm. um you know so Flickr's still out there i i like Flickr. um mm -hmm. the other thing i mean a lot of people are just posting images you know you can't neglect facebook right um right facebook has literally billions of images posted to facebook every day yep. and um so you know, Facebook is an okay place to share. Facebook's a great place to share images with people who already know you or that are, you know, mm -hmm. congregated around a specific purpose. If you're in a Facebook group for a, a given interest, um, you know, that can be an okay place to do that. Um, you know, the challenge with Facebook, depending on, depending on why you're sharing the images, the challenge with Facebook is that, you know, you're kind of up to the whims of their algorithms and what they choose to share or not share with people. Sure. Um, you know, your own website can be a good place. I mean, and again, it kind of depends on what the purposes are. If you're if you're just talking about, you know, as a hobbyist for fun, wanting to put mm -hmm. things out there, yep. um, you know, the other thing is you mentioned Instagram, right? Now, Instagram mm -hmm. obviously is owned owned by Facebook, um, but it's been, you know, it's had a, maybe a less heavy handed approach in far in so far as how kind of the algorithms and curation and things like that go. Um, and the, um, you know, the advertising is maybe a little bit less obtrusive on Instagram. Uh, Instagram can be interesting. Uh, the thing with Instagram, if you're looking to get your work exposed to, uh, to new and interesting people, um, mm -hmm. is the whole hashtag thing, which, you know, for better or for worse, we've all yep. seen the photos on Instagram that have <laughs> a gazillion hashtags associated with them. Yeah. Um, but that's a way that you're going to have new people find your images right and so mm -hmm. um you know one of the techniques that a lot of people will do for hashtags is you know you'll post your image with maybe your title or your caption or your comment or whatever and then in the first comment on that image you can go back in and leave yourself a comment where you dump all of those hashtags in mm -hmm. um, so that they aren't necessarily quite as front and center as people browse your stream uh, but they'll still get picked up by people that are searching or browsing around for those interests. And so, so that's a thing. If you want to get found, um, I see that. What about Unsplash or one of those services? Yeah. Unsplash, um, you know, it can be an interesting way. Again, it kind of depends on what you're looking to get out there. Right. I mean, so mm -hmm. Unsplash, you know, is a place where as a consumer, you can go find a bunch of free photos for use. Um, you know, as somebody, if you want to post your images up there to get them out into the world, you can, um, I mm -hmm. haven't heard a lot of stories of people getting, you know, you know, getting hired or getting a lot of traction from that. Um, you know, yep. there's, if you're looking to get your images out there just to be seen, that's an option. There's also sites like, uh, you know, 500 PX is still around as well, right. which, um, is a very kind of photography focused photo sharing site. Um, you know, but as uh, as uh, as everybody has become a photographer, as everybody has gotten to the point of sharing images online, um, you know, what we've seen is that sharing images online is no longer kind of a niche thing, right? I mean, when Flickr really took off, it was one of the few places that you could really share your images online and have them look decent. I mean, and right. Flickr still Flickr still is one of the few places that if you really want to share images kind of in all their glory is that they will let you do that. They will let you share high resolution images. They will let you set controls around what I want the licensing on this image to be, what, uh, um, 
you know, do I want to allow people to download it or not? Do I want to, you know, make it creative commons? Do I want to reserve all my rights and all that? And so, yep. um, you know, I'm chuckling at the, the comments around <laughs> yeah. people we're, using we're on a Flickr. Cities, the cities, yeah. so, Flickr brings um, back Yahoo Mail and all that stuff. Right. I mean, it is kind of funny, though. I mean, Flickr's gone through an interesting an interesting journey where it was independent, then it got acquired yeah. by Yahoo. They did okay with it for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. uh, then they kind of ran it into the ground, for lack of a better term. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Then it got acquired by Verizon and then a holding group and then sold back to SmugMug, um, which now owns Flickr. And, you know, SmugMug's kind of interesting. SmugMug has been around since the good old days as well. I think they launched mm -hmm. in something like 2004, maybe. Um, and SmugMug is a privately held company uh, by photographers for photographers. Um, um, they've been around for a long time and SmugMug's unique in that they've never had a free plan. <laughs> SmugMug has always been a paid service. You can sign up for and get, and get a you know 14 or 30 day trial for free, but um, SmugMug is a paid service for photo hosting and for photo commerce related things. If you want to sell a 20 by 30 wall print by a professional lab on your, you know, you can set up a SmugMug gallery and do that. Um, and so it will be interesting to see what SmugMug does with Flickr. Um, you know, they came out, you know, since they acquired Flickr, which I guess was probably, was it 2018? So probably a year and a half or so at this point. Mm -hmm. um, They've been gradually fixing up the infrastructure. They moved it onto new servers. Um, they replaced the Yahoo login system. I did see a comment about somebody who forgot their Yahoo password. So, um, you know, you no longer have to use your Yahoo account to log into Flickr, which is good. Um, but one of the other things under SmugMug is that, you know, there's a direction for Flickr at this point, which is they want it to be a site for photographers um, that values photography. They're not worried about being the site for every image on the internet, mm -hmm. um, which was kind of what Yahoo's model ended up being, um, you know, and so, you know, we'll see what happens. Uh, the smug mug leadership has been pretty transparent about Flickr. Um, they came out in, I guess it was in December and mm -hmm. basically said, Hey, we're still losing money with Flickr. We're not, it's not, it's not cutting it at this point. We're going to need right. to raise prices. We're going to need to do something. Um, if you want to support it, join you know, get a pro account. So we'll see. I, yeah. You know, I kind of hope it sticks around for sentimental reasons. Um, also, because I have like 9,000 pictures on my Flickr account. But, um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, we'll see. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to get to this one because I think it's it's a really um, poignant question for the, the time we find ourselves in. Given that we can't hire photographers right now with the global <laughs> pandemic and the world being on lockdown, what should we be doing about photography right now? And what can we do to support those freelance photographers who are out of work? Well, I was talking about how there's beer delivery services now. So, no. <laughs> um, and, and just an aside, I will, I will give a shout out to uh, Reverend Nat Cider. They tried to hook me up with some cider for the show for the unofficial sponsorship, uh, but those pesky state lines wouldn't let them bring it over to me in Vancouver. So I did end up with uh, I did end up with a Portland beer from Culmination Brewing here that I'm drinking. So um, it's all good. Anyway, back to the question. Um, as far as supporting photographers, I think that, um, you know, a lot of it is kind of like supporting any other freelancer. And I think, you know, a lot of it is kind of on the photographer to, um, you know, reach out and put it on themselves um, as far as, um, you know, as far as what they want to do. I mean, a lot of businesses, you know, photographers included, um, you know, are selling gift cards right now. And that's mm. kind of a case where yeah. you can, you know, pay me, la pay me now for, um, you know, for a photo shoot later or something like that. It's not something yep. that I've really entertained given that I'm more working towards a commercial audience. Mm -hmm. um, but for the folks that, um, you know, that do weddings, that do senior portraits, I mean, if you've got a, um, you know, if you've got someone that's a high school senior right now, maybe you'd be doing portraits right now, or you've got a, you've got a high school junior, you've got even a high school sophomore, maybe now's the time mm -hmm. to prepay for a senior portrait shoot for them. 
um, that's going to help a photographer get through things right now. Um, and then you can take care of that down the road. Um, you know, another thing is, um, you know, a lot of photographers, even if it's not their primary thing, a lot of photographers will sell sell prints or metal prints mm -hmm. or canvas or things like that. And, yep. um, you know, if you're in a position where you're not in a financial crunch right now, which, you know, a lot of us are. And so, I mean, hey, if you're if you're struggling to figure out how you're going to pay the rent next month, don't go buy a wall print. I don't want to right. suggest that's more important than buying food. Um, but if you're lucky enough to be in a situation where you have some income right now um, and you've been contemplating, oh, I've got that blank wall in my office that sure could use something to hang on it. Now would be a fantastic time to um, talk to some of your artist friends, photographers or otherwise, and say, hey, I want to support you. Um, you know, what can we do about that? Yeah. Um, and so I, I think those are probably the, uh, you know, the main things that I would say. And then I think the other thing is just to keep in mind is as, as things start loosening in whatever form that takes and with whatever time frame that is, because, you know, that's all unknown right now, you know, as we get to the point where we're able to venture out, where we're able to start doing some things on a limited basis is to just kind of keep in mind that, um, you know, well, there's a lot of businesses that have had to curtail and adapt and things like that. I mean, you know, if we look at restaurants, we look at businesses like that where, you know, yeah, I mean, I'm fortunate in that I can still go to the, the bottle shop and get some beer to go. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there are some businesses such as freelance photographers that are essentially completely shut down right now. And as things start to open up, just kind of keep that in mind and, you know, see who you can help out because um, it'll be it'll be interesting. I mean, you know, the reality is probably not everybody's going to make it through this. There's going to be right. people that are going to pivot to other things. There's going to be people that perhaps were freelance and end up going back to, you know, finding themselves a, you know, a job, mm -hmm. <laughs> a traditional job somewhere. Yep. Um, you know, so it's going to be tough times, um, you know, but, you know, keep those folks in mind as things start opening up. Um, and if you've been kind of wondering about that, or if there's somebody that, you know, you kind of have in mind, certainly reach out to them and say, Hey, how can I support you right now? That's really good advice. Thank you. Um, okay. On that light note, there's one down here. <laughs> I need to, I need to find it. Cause if I don't ask it, it, I'll get busted for it. So, oh, and it's even got three upvotes. So if you were a character in the show, the wire, which one would you Tell be? You and I'll, I'll just I'll just I'll let you guess who asked that one. Oh, right. Right on, Stephen. Um, <laughs> oh, man, who would I be? See, now this is a question I should have prepared for ahead of time mm -hmm. because I, mm -hmm. I should have foreseen this one coming. You um, were taunting one another on Twitter. You knew it was going to happen. You know, hey, I love The Wire. <laughs> it's a great show. I can't convince you. I can't convince my wife to watch it. Hey, if, if the Portland community could convince <laughs> Jennifer to watch The Wire um, with me, um, you have a mission. Um, at least yeah, a exactly. few of you that know my wife. Um, <laughs> oh, who would I be? That's a good question. Um, hmm. Let's come to, back to that one. I'll think okay. about it. We, okay. Don't get off here. I'll come back to this up. Okay. Okay. Um... <laughs> Just as we're and we're getting close to running out of time, but you've already kind of touched on it, which is apart from convincing Jennifer to to watch the wire with you, what what can we as a community be doing to help you personally? Like how how can we how can we help? How can you help? Um, you know, I think the thing what I would say right now is, um, you know, I'm trying to figure out what do things look like? I mean, like my photography business is essentially kind of on hold right now because the, right. the two sorts of photography that I do, you know, event photography and small business photography are pretty much on ice right now. Um, events aren't happening. And, you know, if you look at my, my small business clients, you know, A, I can't go visit them because we can't go visit people right now, but, you know, B, they're often in a world of hurt as well. Um, 
And so, you know, I, I think that's kind of on hold. I mean, one of the things I would say, um, you know, is if you've got folks, if, if you or if people you know are interested in photography and kind of modern photography and the tech side of photography, go over to techphotoguy.com, check out what I've got there, uh, drop your email address right on the homepage and sign up. I send out an email, normally it's about once a week, um, around interesting new tech photo resources that are out there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I've been, I'm amping that up a little bit right now. I, I sent an email out to my list last week asking them, are you interested in hearing from me more right now or not? Mm-hmm. You know, yep. um, cause I didn't want to do that if that was going to be received badly, but the, mm-hmm. I basically told people to vote, you know, keep it the same or send me more stuff. And by about a four to one ratio, they wanted more email from me. Oh, so that's I, great. apparently yeah. I haven't gone full spammer on them yet, which is good. <laughs> um, Although somebody's got to be making money on that. I should look into that. Maybe that's the answer for all those photographers. Um, And so, you know, check out techphotoguy.com. You know, I mean, a lot of the kind of things that we've talked about around, you know, tech and photo advancements and things like that are the sort of things Mm -hmm. that I write about there. Um, You know, the other thing, if you're interested in that book on AI and photography that I'm writing, you can leave your email address there as well. Um, Okay. And actually, I'll give you, if you go to Mm -hmm. ai.techphotoguy.com, that'll take you a landing page directly for the book. It'll get you a free sample chapter that talks all about how I think AI is going to completely kill stock photography here soon. Speaking of Mm -hmm. positive, uplifting subjects in the (laughs) photography industry. Um, But I swear I wrote that chapter before all this went down. Um, And so... um, yeah. And, you know, I mean, I know a lot of you, I mean, at least from the names I see in the chat room, I, a lot of you follow me on Twitter as well. I'm a Hockley there. That's probably, you know, I think my Twitter usage has increased in the last six weeks as all of this has mm-hmm. come down. I think a lot of us have, and that it's, you know, either a place to stay sane or, you know, see what's going on for better or for worse out there in the world. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, let me know if there's any way I can help you all while we're all stuck at home apart. Um, Thanks, Aaron. Yeah, this was really valuable. I mean, part of the reason I wanted to do this is just, you know, we talk a lot, but it's rare to get the chance to talk about your craft in a way. Mm -hmm. And so I was really looking forward to that and really appreciate you taking the time and spending time with us. Last chance, character on the wire. Okay, I feel like I, yeah, I gotta come back. You know, I might, I might end up being. You know, I mean, all things considered, I might be, I might be Bodie. I might kind okay. of get in there. You know, yeah. learn, learn my craft, figure out how to make it work, um, <laughs> and say that you know, get that done. Try and provide some mentorship for the the ones coming up behind me, but uh, you know, might end up you know. Might end up bailing if it gets too crazy. So, <laughs> perfect. All right, that's a good one to end on. Thank you very much, Aaron Hockley of Tech okay. Photo Guy, for being our guest today and for answering all those questions. Uh, up next tomorrow, we'll be talking to Marcelino Alvarez, who some folks may know from Uncorked Studios, but Uncorked got acquired by Fresh, so now they're the Fresh Consulting Office in Portland. And Mars has a great deal of experience with. Uh, crises causing um, a community to come together to build products. So he helped build an open source Geiger counter during the uh, Japanese earthquakes so people can monitor radiation. Right now he's been involved in a lot of projects around um, 3D printing masks or or, peop- or personal protective equipment and, and um, respirators and other equipment like that. So he'll be here tomorrow to talk to us. So show up if you can. If not, it will be recorded. And as always with every episode, if you tuned in late or you had to bail early, the content will be available right here at this link forever. And then we'll go ahead and upload this to YouTube as well. All right. So thanks everybody for tuning in. Thanks again, Aaron. Good to see you. Hang in there, everybody. We'll talk to you later. Thank you. Bye-bye.